May grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God, the Father, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Word of God, which is the basis of the sermon today, is the first verse of Psalm 122. Actually, we will read the entire psalm, but we will concentrate on the first verse. Psalm 122 where we read as follows the sermon text. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is builded as a city that is compact together. Whither the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, unto the testimony of Israel, to give thanks unto the name of the Lord. For there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Peace be within thy walls, and prosperity within thy palaces. For my brethren and companions' sakes, I will now say, Peace be within thee. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. In the name of Jesus, whose habit it was to go to the synagogue every Sabbath day, their fellow redeemed sinners and creatures of the one true, only living, creating, and preserving triune God. Why go to church? Somebody asked you that question, what would you say? Why do you go to church? Is it essential or not? Well, what does God say? That's what we're going to look at today in the sermon. What is the Word of God? What does the Bible say about going to church? Most importantly... And really, the only thing that really matters is God commands it. It's the third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. This has been the way it was from the beginning. Adam and Eve, we are told, at a church. They went to church with their children perhaps also their grandchildren and other descendants. That's where it was found out that Cain's offering was not acceptable to God, but Abel's was at their church. And you keep on going down through the history of the world. Right after the flood, it says that Noah built an altar. He built a church. The first thing he did when he got off the ark, he built a church. And he worshiped there with all the other believers in the world at that time. And it goes on. The next is Abraham. The Bible tells us wherever he went to, he built a church, he built an altar, and he worshiped there with all the other believers around. They gathered together at his altar. And it was the same as he was taught by his father Abraham, Isaac, we are told, built churches wherever he lived. And he gathered there with the other believers regularly on that day, which God himself commanded. In fact, God himself wrote with his own finger on the tables of stone, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It's a holy day. That all of God's children are set aside a day in every week. That is a holy day. And they come together as believers to worship God. Their creator. The one to whom they owe everything. It's only right that we gather together in his house and worship him and hear him speak to us. He who created us, he who sustains us, 
he who holds his life, holds our life in his hands. And so Isaac also taught his son Jacob. And we're told, as we studied in Genesis, everywhere Jacob lived, he went to church. He built an altar and all gathered together regularly in obedience to God's command. And Moses, we're also told that he built altars. In fact, he was commanded by God to build a tabernacle in the midst of God's chosen people, and that they were to gather there regularly, together at the tabernacle. And there they would meet with, with God. And so this tent moved with them, this, this building, this house of God, sat in the center wherever they camped. And as they, they moved around Sinai, they moved the tabernacle, and they always had it there to gather together publicly and worship together. And then finally came King David, the human author of our text today. He wanted to build a temple to God, a permanent building, not a tent. A permanent temple on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. So even though he wanted to do it, it was completed by his son, but there was no gap between the tabernacle and the temple. There was always that building, that place, and that day where all the believers were together together, and God commanded all the Old Testament believers. You can have your local synagogues, and your local, wherever you are in the world, your local towns, to gather together on the holy day, but three times a year, all the believing males were to come to the temple in Jerusalem and gather together publicly. And then came the New Testament. The very first words that we have recorded that Jesus Christ said, not the first words he said, but the first recorded words he said were spoken where? In the temple in Jerusalem, God's house, where all the believers were to gather together regularly. Jesus did, and he said, I'm here to do my Father's business. And so we're told in the Bible over and over again, as you who are studying the Gospel of Mark now in our adult Bible class, you know. It was Jesus' habit, it was his custom, the Bible says, every single Sabbath day to be in the synagogue. He had to because it was a command of God and he had to be perfect to be our Savior. He had to obey the commandments of God. He willingly did it as... David says here, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And then it went on after Jesus died for our sins and rose again and ascended into heaven. We're told in the book of Acts that the believers were all gathered together in one accord. So, we have God's command. The third commandment, the sanctity of Sunday worship at church. It's always been there. Christians have always done it. They know it's a command. And true Christians say, I was glad to have it. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We see in our society a great breakdown. First, it was the sanctity of the fifth commandment. Sanctity of life, thou shalt not kill. Then it was the sanctity of the sixth commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, the sanctity of marriage. Now we have the sanctity of the Sunday worship at church. The third commandment, being degraded. What commandment will be next on the world's list? On Satan's list to degrade. Hear with me what the Bible says about this. These are all quotes from Scripture. 
not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. Again, the Bible says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together. Again, when ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine. Again, the Bible says, ye come together. Now here, this is from 1 Corinthians. And there were problems in the Corinthian church that God was addressing through the Apostle Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians. We now have it in the Bible. There were problems there. But they were still coming together. But here Paul addresses some of the problems that were going on in their worship services when they come together. And he says, but still come together. But when you do, do this. I'll read it. Ye come together, it says, not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in eating every one taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry for one another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. Jesus himself said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Even if there's just two believers, they should gather together. The Bible says on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they, meaning the Christians, were all with one accord in one place. So, why go to church? Because God commands it. That should be enough if we truly love God and want to serve him. But there's more reasons. Another reason. Our catechism, when it uh, describes or explains the third commandment, it says this. That we should, quote, hold preaching and God's word sacred and gladly hear and learn it. Because it is here at God's house, where his word is preached, and we should then be glad to come and hear it. As David said in the psalm, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord, because there we hear the truth, the truth that Christians love, the truth of law and gospel. As it goes on in verse 5 to say in the psalm, for there are set thrones of judgment, and thrones of the house of David. Thrones of judgment. Here you hear the law of God, the commandments. What God commands you to do as his creatures. He has the right to command you. He made you. Your life is in his hands now and eternally. It's good to hear his law, but when we hear it, we also feel our sin. We have not kept his law perfectly. In fact, we have fallen far short of his glory. We are poor, sinful creatures. We need to hear that. The world doesn't tell you that. Only God tells you that in his word. We need to know that we cannot save ourselves, that eternal life is not ours by anything that we can do. Judgment is upon us by nature. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The wages of sin is death. We all fall under that condemnation. 
Here we hear that regularly, every week. Well, we should. For that causes us not to trust in ourselves, trust in lies, trust in our own false righteousness, which does not avail before Almighty God. But it causes us then to flee for refuge to Jesus Christ, the house of David, the son of David, the descendant of David, the great eternal king of Israel, who will sit on David's throne forever and ever. Jesus Christ, promised from the beginning by God, after the first sin of Adam and Eve, he said, I will send the seed of the woman, and he will crush the head of the serpent, Satan. He will defeat Satan's works, Satan's seed, Jesus, and he would be descended from not only Adam and Eve, he'd be descended from Noah, he'd be descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and descended from David. And so Jesus Christ fulfilled all of those prophecies of the coming Savior, that God himself would come down and become a true man, descended from true human beings, but without that nature of sin that we all inherit from father and mother, or he would only have human mother. Conceived by the Holy Ghost and the Virgin Mary, God the Son, come for one reason, because we're sinners, and he loves us anyway. His love brought him down to us poor, lost sinners, that he might have us as his own in heaven for all eternity. And he paid the full price of our sins in our place on a cross. All of the sin of the world was laid upon Jesus Christ, God and man. He had no sin of his own. He was perfect God. He was perfect man. But he also died. Not his own, for his own sins he had none, but for our sins. He died our death, met God's justice upon all sins of the world, himself. And all who come to him, Jesus says, I will in no wise cast out. All who come to me and believe in me are forgiven of all their sins before God. They will not come into condemnation, but have passed from death to life. We hear that message here every week. These walls resound with that message of God's love in Christ Jesus, the forgiveness of sins, and the promise of heaven. That's another good reason to go to church, where the law and the gospel is sounded loudly every week. And true Christians want to go there. They say, I was glad to go there. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord to hear God's word, law, and gospel. And they know when they come here, that's all they're going to hear and nothing else. No human philosophy or anything like it. Now, do you know everything in the Bible? No, no one does. No one does. There's always more to learn. There's always another reason to come. And even if you did know it, you'd forget some of it, and it'd have to be repeated to you, even though you've already known it. And so that's why we come. Our bodies need food. Our bodies need to be fed. How often do we feed our bodies? And do we ever grow tired of eating? Do we ever grow tired of eating physical food for our bodies? Well, our souls also need to be fed. Our souls, our immortal souls, need to be fed, and the only good food for them is God's Word. And here, we spread a meal every Lord's Day for our souls to come and feast. A banquet. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord for my soul to eat that banquet. 
those who are of the strongest faith, who know the word of God best, are those who say, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go unto the house of the Lord. Again, what does the Bible say? The Bible says this, How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts! My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found an house, and sw a swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will still be praising thee. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Again, the Bible says, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God and be more ready to hear. The Bible also says, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. But there's more. There's more reasons to go to church. Because here you find shalom, peace, rest. Shabbat, Hebrew word for rest. Here is a place where you rest, where you have peace for your soul. Because we live in a very evil, sinful world. And the sins of the world have caused great hardship for every person in it. We have hard lives. There is no person in this world whose life is easy and trouble-free. There are family troubles. There are sadnesses. There are concerns for the world's condition, and I can go on and on and on. And inside of ourselves, we have faults, we have weaknesses, we feel our own failings, our own struggles. We get tired and weary. We have pressures upon us. Here is where we can come for peace and rest. If you do not come regularly to God's house on the Shabbat day, our spirits would sink into despair and depression. But here, God meets us and takes the heaviness of life in this sinful world, takes the heaviness from our hearts. And so, the psalmist says, I was glad, not depressed, not sad. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It gave him joy in an otherwise world of sadness. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Verse 7, peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces, for my brethren and companions' sakes, I will now say, Peace, shalom, be within thee. Here is a place of quiet. No distractions, like at home. Undisturbed, you can fill your mind with God's truth, with God's law and gospel with his word of love and salvation, and with the peace, as the Bible says, that passes all understanding. 
here your mind can be filled with calm, your soul with holy joy. Here we are prepared to go back out of these walls, back into the world, to do battle with Satan, filled with the Holy Ghost, who has come to us through word and the Lord's Supper. Again, we turn to the Bible. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest to your souls. The Bible says, Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. The Bible says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, and they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go unto the house of the Lord. But there's other reasons to, to go to church also. Another reason is there or here we confess Christ publicly. Not privately. Publicly. Before other people. And in so doing, we set an example to other people by gathering together with them. On the other hand, when we don't gather together with other people, we set a bad example. By not going to God's house, by not honoring the Sabbath day. We set a good example by coming, a bad example by not. And I say an example not just to the people outside the church. That's very true. It's an evangelistic thing to come to church for no other reason. When other people see us doing that. They think, well, that must be important to them. There must be something important there. Maybe I ought to think about it. But it's also an example to each other in the church, to the other members. And it's a bad example to the other members when we don't come. The example you set, believe it or not, people are watching you. You might not think you're important, but you are. You're a human being. And as a believer in Christ, you're a child of God. People watch you. God has set you here as a light to the world, a salt to the earth, an example. And you're seen by other people, both outside and inside the church. Maybe those people outside have cold hearts toward God. But when they see you go to church, it's like hearing church bells on Sunday morning, reminding them of God. Yeah, I better think about God. And the fellow believers inside the church, you think they're not encouraged when they see you here? They are. Each one of us is. We encourage each other in our faith by our fellowship. You have more influence than me, the pastor, in that regard. People expect me to be here. But when you come, you encourage your fellow believers. You love your neighbor in the greatest way possible by setting that example. I'm not like to read you a quote. This is a quote by a deaf woman. This is an elderly deaf woman. And she always went to church. Even though she was deaf, she couldn't hear. But she didn't stop going to church for that reason. She still went to church regularly. And she wrote down why she did it. And here's what she said. Though I cannot hear, I come to God's house because I love it. It brings to me many sacred recollections. I can see the minister speak 
And I can read the hymns which the congregation sings. Another reason is because I am not in the because I am in the best of company, in the most immediate presence of God and among his people. I'm not satisfied with serving God in private. It is my duty and privilege to honor God regularly and constantly in public. I want you to think for a moment of Christians who've gone before us, many of them have been persecuted by the world for going to church. Communist countries hate Christianity. They're trying to wipe it out. It's uh, clearly stated in all of their documents. They think religion is false. It's the opiate of the masses and all that kind of stuff. And they've persecuted Christians wherever they've taken control. Thanks be to God, we haven't lived under that yet. But think of the Christians who, in times of persecution, have even then continued to meet together on the Lord's Day, to bolster each other under that persecution. Well, it works the same way when you're not persecuted also. Jesus said, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I also confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Christians in Rome, wrote this, That I may be comforted together with you, by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Even the Apostle Paul needed the fellowship of gathering together with other Christians. The Bible says, Praise ye the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. In the congregation will I bless the Lord. Now, are there times when going to church is not physically possible? Yes, there are. And it's a sad thing. It's a sad thing. If I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord, it was a sad thing when they said, you can't go to the house of the Lord. It's a sad thing. When it's physically impossible to go to church because of sickness, because of infirmity, being a shut-in, not able to leave the house, but be careful. Are you truly shut in? Or do you go other places? The people who are truly shut in and cannot go to the house of the Lord deserve our sympathy. They deserve our visits. They deserve our calls. But just to go somewhere else or do anything but go to church flies in the face of the third commandment of God. Examine your excuses carefully, dear friends, for you will have to present them on Judgment Day. Listen to your conscience. Your conscience mirrors the Ten Commandments. And Jesus said, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. I was glad, and they said unto me, Let us go unto the house of the Lord. Amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all of man's understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus.